if you would this morning open up your Bible and turn to the book of Joshua. We're going to continue our study of Joshua and we're going to look at chapter 5 this morning. Joshua chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1 and read the whole of the chapter, so hear the word of our God. As soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel like Gabith Ha'arloth. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who had come out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war, who came out of Egypt perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, and so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land unleavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land, and there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the word of God. And so we pray this morning, would you speak to us? Would you speak to our hearts? We have read your word, and now we ask that you would take your word and that you would do a work in us. We pray, Jesus, incline our hearts to you. Incline our hearts to your will that we might walk in your ways. Lord Jesus, we need your work this morning. And so come, preach to us. Amen. So after thinking about Joshua chapter 5 all this week, I have but, I have but one question on my heart. Are you in fellowship with God? Are you in fellowship with God? And I want to sit with this question for a bit because our minds run about with so many different cares and concerns. Even this morning, right now, cares and concerns press on us. Tomorrow is Monday. It's the start of a new week. And as we look forward to a new week, there are all of these things that need to get done, this long to-do list, and our mind can just run there. Even more, as we sit here this morning, there is last week, and often there are tasks left undone, there are these projects left lingering, there are all these situations that have not yet been resolved, and our minds go there. And as a result, with all of these matters pressing, maybe more, it can be hard to think straight and to think clearly, to think deeply. So I just want to sit here for a moment And slow down and focus on this one question. Are you in fellowship with God? Now you might hear that question. You might reply, well, what do you mean by this word 
fellowship with God. And there are many different ways we can talk about it. We can use spatial words to help us think about fellowship with God. Are you far from God or are you near God? Is God distant from you or is he close to you? Is there something separating you from the Lord, something in between you and the Lord separating you from him? We can use words of temperature, words like cold or cool or lukewarm or warm or hot. Is your heart cold and lifeless? Is it dull towards the Lord? We can use highly relational words. Are you on friendly terms with the Lord your God? And is God on friendly terms with you? Or we can use different words. Do you love the Lord your God? And in love, do you keep his commandments? And to ask a more profound question, does this God of the Bible love you? We can use words of commitment. Are you bound to the Lord? Are you bound to him? Is God bound to you? We can use words of activity. Do you walk with God? Do you live near God? Is that your life? We can use tactile words. Is your heart hard towards God and the things of God? Is there this stubbornness in your soul that resists the Lord? Or is your heart soft towards the Lord? There is this pliableness in your soul where you easily yield yourself to the Lord and what he has for you. Now, as we think about it, the Bible has all of, uses all of these expressions and more to describe our fellowship with him. As we look at our Bibles, we learn it is possible to be far from God, to be separated from the life of Christ, to be lost and without hope. Paul tells us about this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. He tells us it is possible to be at odds with God, to be an adversary of the Lord's, warring against him and his purposes. The Bible tells us it's possible to be living in the the far land like the the prodigal son with a hard and rebellious heart. But the Bible also tells us that it is possible to live near God, to be near God. And as we think about it, this is what the gospel of Jesus Christ has accomplished for God's people. Paul proclaims good news to us in Ephesians 2.13. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What has God done? He's done that objective work for his people, moving us into fellowship with him. Because of the objective work of Christ, it is possible to experience subjectively nearness of God. You can walk in his pleasure. The light of his face can can light your way and, and guide your steps. The sweet joy of his nearness can be your consolation. You can actually taste it. So James chapter 4, verse 8 speaks of this experiential, this lived nearness of God. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And so I ask you, do you have fellowship with God? Now Joshua chapter 5, as we move our way into this text, teaches us that this question is the most important matter. And Joshua chapter 5 teaches us that this is the most important matter by bursting our expectations. Just think with me as we enter back into the story of Joshua. What should our expectations be after reading and working through four chapters of this story? Well, I think our expectation should be this. Israel should immediately go and take the land. They should grab it for themselves. And we have been primed for this in the first four chapters. Let me remind you. In chapter one, we heard this conversation between the Lord and Joshua, and the Lord is prepping Joshua, and he says, chapter one, verse two, now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people into the land that I am giving to them. Then we move on into chapter two, and we hear this conversation between Rahab and the two spies. And Rahab says this, chapter two, verse nine, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. Then we moved into chapter 3 and into chapter 4, and we watched the Lord at work. He, He stopped up the Jordan River. He dried out the land, and then Israel passed through on dry ground, entering into the land. And Joshua stood there before all of this happened, and he preached to them, and he said this to the people, chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Here's how you shall know the living God is among you, 
and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. And as we turn to our text, chapter 5, this same exact note is played again in our ears. Look at verse 1. As soon as the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they crossed over, their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. As we think about all of this, we've heard this note played again and again and again. Our expectation is this. It's go time for Israel. They have the promise. They have God's leader for them. They have crossed the Jordan. They went through it. Now they're in the land. The army of Israel is there. The inhabitants of the land, they are all shaking in their boots. It's time to to press the advantage. It's time to begin the conquest. Your enemy is backpedaling and wobbling. It's time to throw the haymaker and knock these people out. Or at the very least, it's time to assemble the troops and get them in battle position so that the war might begin. But Joshua chapter 5 bursts our expectations. None of this happens. Look at Joshua chapter 5. What happens in this chapter? First of all, we find that Joshua circumcises the men of war. Joshua handicaps his whole army by doing a surgery on their genitals. I mean, think about it. Generals, commanders usually don't weaken their troops on the eve of battle. They try to strengthen them. Even worse, think about this. Joshua makes his whole army essentially defenseless in enemy territory. One just has to remember the story of Genesis chapter 34 to understand just how weak and defenseless circumcision can make an adult man. We read in that story of Simeon and Levi, they they go and they wipe out a whole city because they are recovering from circumcision. And the oddities continue. After this circumcision, this surgery Israel holds a feast to the Lord. As we think about it, that's not something you usually do before battle. That's something you do after battle. You you win the war and then you celebrate and you worship. But they do that before the battle. And then after this feast, Joshua has this strange encounter with this man, the commander of the Lord's army. And the text leaves us with this scene. Joshua is face down in the dirt and he is worshiping. So Joshua chapter 5 bursts our expectations. And by bursting our expectations, this chapter reveals to us the priority of our God. This chapter, just the way it's structured, teaches us there is something more important than conquest. There is something more important than pressing the advantage against the Canaanites. There is something more urgent than the work of warfare. And what chapter 5 tells us, it is this, it is fellowship with God. It's what we see in chapter 5 is the Lord reestablishing fellowship with his people and then the people carefully maintaining their fellowship with their God. And so as we look at chapter 5, there's three scenes to it. It starts with a circumcision scene, it moves into a Passover scene, and then we have this encounter between Joshua and the commander of the Lord's army. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to work through each one of these scenes and we're going to do so with our eyes fixed on the matter of fellowship. What do these scenes have to do with fellowship with God? And after we work through these scenes, we're going to draw out some applications for ourselves from Joshua chapter 5. So let's start with this, this first scene, the circumcision of Israel. And so the scene moves forward. It's a rather straightforward scene. We look at verse 2, and the Lord speaks to Joshua, and the Lord gives Joshua a command. The Lord says, Make flint knives, and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. And so Joshua hears the word of the Lord, and he immediately obeys the word of the Lord. Verse 3. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gabith Ha'arloth, which literally means the hill of foreskins. But here, as we take in verse 2 and verse 3, our, furs brow, fur, our brows furrow, or at least they, they should do something like that. We're reading this story, and as good readers, we should ask why. And we should ask why for two reasons. First, 
why circumcise Israel on the eve of battle? As we're thinking about it, that seems to be strategically unwise. Why would you weaken your men? Well, the answer we get from the text in Joshua chapter 5 is this. They must be circumcised because they weren't circumcised. It's as simple as that. And this raises a, a second question for us as readers. We ask, well, why weren't they circumcised? Specifically, we ask, why weren't they circumcised by their fathers? Now, this whole thing about circumcision might be hazy to you. And so we need to remind ourselves about it and what it means. And so circumcision was a sign given to Abraham by God. It was this physical sign, this mark on the body that pointed to the Lord's covenant with Abraham. And this mark, this sign, preached a very simple message from God to Abraham saying this, you belong to me. That's what the covenant sign meant. You belong to me. You are my possession. I am your God. And every male born to Abraham was to be circumcised, catch this, on the eighth day. This is all detailed in Genesis chapter 17. It's all very clear. But as we read our Bible, circumcision is not just a reality, a physical reality, just this mark on the body. It's to be this inward reality, a reality of the heart, a mark on the heart. And so as you read your Bibles and as you move into the book of Deuteronomy, we find Moses saying things like this, Deuteronomy 11.16. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. And we ask Moses, well, what in the world do you mean by circumcising your heart? Well, what would you want from us? Well, he explains in that same chapter, verses 12 and 13 of Deuteronomy 11, he preaches this. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord. So what is the Lord doing? He gives this physical sign to Abraham, and it means you are mine. And what it really needs to mean, it means, it means something of the heart to where you, you give your heart to God. I will serve you with my life. So let's put this together. We're putting together these different pieces. We've got Genesis 17. We've got Deuteronomy chapter 11. And then we come to Joshua chapter 5. And for paying attention, we see something flabbergasting. This is stunning. Look in Joshua chapter 5. What do we see? We see an entire generation of Israel uncircumcised. We see an entire generation of men missing the mark of of the covenant. It should stun us as readers. And we ask again, why weren't these men circumcised by their fathers? What went wrong here? Well, look at the text. Joshua 5, verse 5, verse 6. The narrator is trying to help us understand what is going on here. And so he writes this. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. So the narrator is trying to give us the reason for why this generation was not circumcised and the reason he camps out on is this, the disobedience of this wilderness generation. Do you remember what happened? This wilderness generation, they, they drew near to the, to the land of Israel and the Lord said, go up, take it. But the spies came back and they brought this bad report and so Israel feared and they, they turned back from following the Lord. And what the narrator is telling us, there's this downstream consequence of this wickedness and the downstream consequence of this wickedness seems to be that they refused to circumcise their sons. What we see is that this generation that despised fellowship with God in the land refused to give their sons the mark of fellowship on their bodies. And so here we can see why the Lord stops the story. He throws on the brakes. Why? Because this generation needs to be circumcised. Before this generation can do anything in the land, before it can do anything for the Lord, they must be put right with God. They must bear the mark of the covenant on their flesh and they must live it out from their hearts. So what does the Lord do? Well, in his mercy, he reestablishes fellowship with his people. Verse 7. So it was their children whom he raised up in their place. 
And so what does the Lord do? In his mercy, he removes the shame of the sin of their fathers. And he says, verse 9, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So this is the first scene. We see this circumcision scene. And what is the Lord doing? He's reestablishing fellowship with his people, putting this generation right. And this moves us to the second scene, this Passover scene. And so after circumcision, Israel then keeps the feast of Passover to the Lord. We hear about it in verse 10. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And this is a momentous event for the people of Israel, for they feast with the produce of the land. And as a result, we see in verse 12 and verse 13, is that manna stops coming from heaven. And the Lord is now going to provide for his people from the land that is promised. And as we think about verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, all sorts of images should be cycling through our minds. We think of the Passover, we think of roasted lamb and and unleavened bread and bitter herbs. We think of the the scene of smearing blood with with hyssop on the doorposts of house, on the lintel of the house. And we ask, well, what does this scene mean for Israel? What does this have to do with, with fellowship? Well, two facts about the Passover have to be noted here. First of all, we must note that Passover is a meal founded on sacrifice. The shed blood is important to this meal, and it points to this. The shed blood shields Israel from destruction. So we go back to the first Passover, Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. The Lord says this to Israel. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So we see this is a meal founded on blood, founded on sacrifice. And then there's the second element to Passover. It is a meal of fellowship. And so in the Old Testament, we read about all these different sacrifices. And some of the sacrifices for sin, you would offer up your animal and you wouldn't get to partake of any of the animal. It was gone. But here we see something different. Israel gets to eat the lamb that is offered and gets to eat the lamb in the presence of God. And this eating is revealing something to Israel. It is telling Israel that they are at peace with God and they get to enjoy God's presence. They get to fellowship with God as they eat this meal in his presence. And so we're taking in this scene. And what are we seeing here? What do we see of God here? What's his desire for his people Well, we see this. God wants, before Israel does anything in the land of Canaan, he wants his people to remember this, that their life is founded upon blood. Why do they have fellowship with him? Because of blood and blood alone. Even more, he wants Israel, before they engage a single enemy, he wants his people to enjoy a meal of fellowship in his presence. What does God want at the beginning of this conquest? He wants Israel to come to him and share the riches of the covenant and to enjoy friendship with him. What does God want? He wants friendship with his people that they might feast in his presence and know the joy of his friendship. So that's the second scene. That's the the Passover. We see fellowship, a fellowship meal between God and his people after circumcision. And this brings us to the third scene. And this is this meeting between Joshua and the commander of the Lord's army. So the first two scenes are really earthy scenes. Flint knives, foreskins, blood, meal, roasted lamb. But when we come to this third scene, it's otherworldly. Out of nowhere, it seems, this man shows up. And the text alerts us to the suddenness, to the surprising nature of this event. And so we get verse 13. The text reads, when when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, if we're reading the text, it should be a surprise, and behold, look, a man standing before him with his drawn sword in his hands. Now, this raises many questions in our minds. Who is this man? What is this man? And the nature of this man is not explicitly revealed in this text. But as we piece it together, I think it is best to see this man as an angel of the Lord. Here is likely the same angel that appeared to Moses at the burning bush. Here is likely the same angel that led Israel through the wilderness. The very same angel that the Lord put his name in. 
This very same angel that carried and bore the presence of the Lord. So if you were in the presence of this angel, you'd be in the presence of God. Now what's interesting is the text doesn't let us get bogged down with all of these details. Our minds are running there. But the text focuses our attention on something else. It wants us to consider carefully the conversation between Joshua and this commander of the Lord's army. So Joshua sees this man. And this causes Joshua to go to him and speak to him. And so he starts the conversation with a question, verse 13. Are you for us or for our adversaries? That's a good question. Are you with us or are you against us? And so the man replies, verse 14, unsettling the way he replies. No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. So what does Joshua do? Well, he hears that word, and he immediately bends low. He sticks his face in the dirt, and he begins to worship. He realizes that he is in the presence of God. Here is the angel who bears the name of the Lord. Here is the angel who bears the presence of God. He bends low just like Moses did in the beginning of the book of Exodus. But the conversation doesn't stop. Moses, bent low, worshiping, asks another question, verse 14. What does my Lord say to his servant? And again, the man replies. He says, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. Just consider this conversation very carefully. We have two military commanders here in dialogue. We have Joshua, the commander of Israel's army, and then we have this man, this angel, who is the commander of God's angelic host. Here they are in conversation, two military commanders. What do we expect? Well, we expect that these two military commanders would probably talk about something military in nature, maybe battle plan, troop movements, maybe something about siege warfare. But where does this conversation go between these two commanders? Well, it goes to worship. How does the conversation end? It ends with Joshua on the ground with his face to the ground. It ends with Joshua even more importantly. What is he doing at the end of this conversation? He is taking his shoes off of his feet for the ground on which he is standing, this ground on which Israel is entering, is holy. What does this mean? It means that Joshua must consecrate himself to the Lord. Joshua must give himself to holy fellowship with God. And here this issue of fellowship emerges again. The Lord sent this commander to call Joshua, and I think in Joshua, all of the people of Israel into holy fellowship with the Lord. The Lord desires that Joshua and all the people as they enter into the land and as they do the work of conquest would maintain holy fellowship with him. And here we see the most important matter for Israel is not the the battle plans or the troop movements or anything about siege warfare. Rather, the most important matter is this, holy fellowship with their God. And this surprising scene between Joshua and the commander of the Lord's army raises a question that we'll have to think through throughout the rest of the book of Joshua. Will Israel, will the whole congregation of Israel bend low like Joshua does here? Or will they rebel? Will they devote themselves to holy fellowship with God? Or will they do something else? And that's how this surprising chapter ends. So we have these three scenes in front of us. We have circumcision. We see that's about fellowship. We have this Passover. We see it's a meal about fellowship. And then we have this meeting between these two commanders. And we see this too is about fellowship with the Lord. And, and we need to ask you, well, what are we supposed to take away from this chapter? What are we supposed to, to learn? And I think that there are three lessons that we need to learn from chapter five. And the three lessons are these. First lesson Fellowship with God is our prize. Fellowship with God is our prize. Second lesson, fellowship with God must be our priority. And the third lesson is this, we must then purpose ourselves to fellowship with God. Let's just work through those. So first lesson to learn, fellowship with God is our prize. Just think about the logic of Joshua chapter five. The Lord is delaying Israel's inheritance of the land. Before they can inherit the land, take the land, Israel first must be circumcised, then they must keep the Passover feast and eat in the presence of God. 
And then Joshua has to have this strange meeting with the commander of the Lord's army. And what these events, I think, preach to us, to Israel and to us, is a message. It's, it's a warning, I think. The logic of chapter 5, connected with the first four chapters with it, says something like this. Dear reader, while the land is good, while it flows with milk and honey, while it is God's delight and pleasure to give this land to his people because he promised it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, do not be confused. This is what God is saying. The land nor the many good things found in it are your ultimate prize. The Lord is preaching. He's saying, I am your prize. I am your inheritance. And therefore, I must be your delight. I think that's how the logic preaches to us. And as we think about it, the same logic applies to us. Let me ask you, why is the forgiveness of sins so good? Or think about some of the great doctrines of the Bible. We have like the doctrine of the new birth, uh, the doctrine of faith and repentance, the doctrine of justification and, and sanctification. Why are these doctrines, when we think about them and when we read them and, and when we ponder them, why are they so sweet? Why do we love our Bible so much and reading them and, and finding promises in them? Why do we like gathering as God's people and listening to God's words? Well, the answer is this, because all of these things establish our fellowship with God and lead us to fellowship with God. Why do we love all of these things? Because they bring us to our prize, God himself, knowing him, being in fellowship with him. So hear this warning that Joshua 5 gives us, and remember this, God himself is your prize. God himself is your prize. So second lesson. If God, fellowship with God, if God is our prize, then fellowship must be our priority. And so we can think about the logic again of Joshua chapter 5. Before the Lord lets Israel do anything in the land of Canaan, before the Lord lets Israel engage with any enemy, what does the Lord do? He reestablishes fellowship with his people. That's first priority for the Lord in the land. And we would be wise, very wise, to let this logic of Joshua 5 sink into our hearts. Because we see this, hear this. The Lord prioritizes, the Lord values, the Lord treasures fellowship over work, fellowship over busy activities, fellowship over achievement. That's what we see here. What does the Lord want? He wants fellowship with his people before anything else. And if that's true, fellowship must be our priority. We would be wise, very wise, to start off our day with a simple question. Am I in fellowship with God? If fellowship with God is our prize, then fellowship with God must be our priority. Then we would be wise to consider whether or not we are in fellowship with God. And we can ask questions of our souls in two different distinct ways. First of all, in asking this question, am I in fellowship with God? We must ask it objectively. That means we're asking it in a gospel sort of way. And here as we ask this question in a gospel sort of way, we only can give yes or no questions. It goes like this. Have I been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son? Yes or no? Has my heart been circumcised by the Spirit of God? Have I been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? Yes or no? Has the blood of the greater Passover lamb, the blood of Jesus himself, has that been applied to my soul? Yes or no? We would be wise to start there. And then we would be wise to ask this question in a subjective sort of way. And this is something that only Christians can do. You only can ask these subjective questions if you say yes to the objective questions. And so we can ask, and it would be wise to do this often, is the Lord near to me? Am I near the Lord? Is the Lord far from me, distant from me? Have I become distant from the Lord, wandering from him? Do I taste the sweetness of my God's presence? Do, do I know the comforts of his fellowship? Do I really know them? Do I see, have I really see, do I really see the, the light of his face as it shines upon me in the gospel of Jesus? 
Am I neglecting the Lord my God? Somehow, some way, has something risen up and now there is this separation between me and the Lord. There is something hindering my fellowship with him standing in the way. Am I walking in his commandments? He's told me to walk in his commandments. Am I walking in them, doing what he has called me to do? Am I in fellowship with the Lord? We would be wise, very wise, to ask questions like that of our souls, objectively and then subjectively. Third lesson. Purpose yourself to fellowship. I think Joshua 5, the logic of it preaches a command to us, and the logic preaches this, fellowship with the Lord your God. Just think about this for a moment. God saved Israel from Egypt. He covenanted with them at Sinai. He led them through the wilderness. He provided for their needs, giving them manna from heaven and water from the rock, birds from the heavens as well. He, he brought them to the land. He, he dried up the Jordan, brought Israel through. Why did he do this? So that he might purpose Israel for himself. And as a result, Israel, his people, might purpose themselves for him. What does God want? He wants his people to purpose their hearts for fellowship with him. Each one of these scenes is preaching that to us. And as we think about it, God has done greater things for us. What has he done? He has sent his son into this world. Christ lived and he died and he was resurrected. Then he, he went up to heaven and then he poured out his spirit. And what has God done? He has poured his spirit out into our hearts. And the result is, if you are in Christ, you are freed from the law of sin and death. And why has God done this? He has done this so that he might purpose you for himself. And as a result, you might, with the freedom of your heart, purpose yourself for God. This is the glory of the gospel, that you might set your heart, even more, that you might set the totality of your humanity on God, that you might serve him and love him. Why has God done all of these things so that you might in turn, with the freedom of your heart, give yourself to God? And so we can close with a call and a command from Joshua chapter 5. In light of God's great works that we have seen, in light of the gospel, hear this. Brother, sister, in Jesus, purpose yourself to fellowship with your God. I command you, in light of all that we have heard Make fellowship with God the agenda of your life. Make fellowship with God the agenda of your week, of your day. Say to yourself, I will fellowship with my God. This is the message and the call of Joshua chapter 5. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for this text. We need it. We're so thankful that you are the God who circumcised Israel in the land we're so thankful that you are the God who gave the feast of Passover, that you are the God who sent your, your, your commander of your army to meet with Joshua. And we receive these words, and we say in light of them, we will purpose ourselves for fellowship with you. Oh, Father, would you work in our hearts now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.